Good evening and welcome to ACME, the National Museum of Film, Television, Video Games, Art and Digital Culture. Uh, my name is Monique Rizé Faccioni. I'm the Senior Curator of Public Programs. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri and Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land we meet and share ideas. I pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from all nations of this land. So my task this evening is a pretty simple one. First, welcome all of you to Jocelyn Morehouse Talks Unconditional Love. We're really delighted to be able to host this conversation in, in conjunction with text publishing about so many things that are really, really important to us about storytelling, about love and family by one of country's preeminent filmmakers. Second to housekeeping, our talk will run for about one hour and there'll be a little time for audience questions at the end. Please wait though for the microphone to ask your questions as we are live streaming this talk this evening. Um, and of course, Jocelyn will be signing copies of her book, Unconditional Love, from a quarter to eight tonight. The signing and copies of her story are available downstairs at the Acme store, and the bookstore will close at 8.15. And finally, but not least, to our fabulous host this evening, Virginia Trioli. Virginia is a two-time... Oh, don't go reading out the whole thing. I'm going to read it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't read it out. I feel like that's unfair. <laughs> yes, she's amazing. Do uh, she's done lots of things. She's a reporter. She's yeah. a host. All da, da, of da, 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 da. No, no, no. Virginia is actually going to replace, I'm going to say this, John Fain and present the morning program on ABC Radio <laughs> Melbourne very soon. Thank you. Um, and she is obviously clearly amazing. What I will say is Virginia is married with three stepchildren. And a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. A seven-year-old, right. sorry. Yeah. Old bio. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Please join me in welcoming them both. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Um, sorry to edit you uh, on the on the run in that way. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome. And um, it's my happy task this evening to sit in conversation with, yes, uh, one of our great screenwriters and directors Jocelyn Morehouse. As you know, she's the writer, the director of some of our most beloved films, most recently The Dressmaker, but going all the way back to her first feature film and something a film that was embraced by so many of us, Proof, uh, How to Make an American Quilt and A Thousand Acres, amongst other projects. She's written a beautiful memoir, which is called Unconditional Love. And that's uh, where the title of our discussion comes from. Will you please make her very welcome, Jocelyn Morehouse. Thank you. It's nice to sit here chatting to you. I quite yes. like this. It's, it's fun. Is my microphone close enough? <laughs> Can, you Can you hear Jocelyn? Can you hear me? Okay, good. But don't, don't feel like you've got to, you know, be all over it. They can... Okay. They can turn some things up there, I think. <laughs> hey, this is your field. You're, the, you're supposed to know no, all about the sound that, and the... Well, yeah. <laughs> Cameras, yes. Yeah, okay. Not the sound <laughs> stuff. Um, it is a, it's a lovely memoir. Thank you. Was it um, percolating away in you for a long time? Um, well, I've always written. Uh, so um, ever since I was about 12, year old, 12 years old, I was writing diaries. And I, it's not like I've written every, every day since then. Um, but there's been periods of my life where I've kept journals. So I think it was just a natural reaction to... Um, a lot of stuff that was happening to me uh, that made me want to create a memoir. Mm. Um, my parents had just died, pretty close to each other, just a couple of years in between. Mm. And um, I found myself pretty overwhelmed with a lot of emotions, a lot of memories, a lot of beautiful memories. And kind of when, when someone you love dies, or particularly a parent, you start to see their life, you see the beginning, the middle and the end. Mm. And you realise it's it's a story um, and what better way to talk about them and then talk about my own um, emotional journey from young girl to mother to artist and all the stuff that's in between um, than to see it as a story. Mm. And it was quite healing to write it that way but I also wanted to reach out to other women um, and men, but mostly women, um, because I feel my story is about being a woman yeah. um, and the female experience um, and how you 
you go through these many roles as a woman. I want to go back in time and um, not necessarily start at the, at the beginning, but you, you mentioned healing and, and we'll get to that too. But each of your chapters begin begins with a, a lovely epigram of a – usually a filmmaker actually. A yes. lot of them are from filmmakers. Sometimes writers. Sometimes writers and um, – but really great thinkers. And uh, one of them, and I'm, I'm going to – I'm sure slightly misquoted here but you'll correct me, is from Maya Angelou who is probably the most quotable of oh, yes. any writer you'll – all of her prose is, uh, is she's, just – She's a beautiful writer. Perfect writer. epigrams yeah. and yeah. sort of perfect life lessons. But the one that you quote is um, – that it's uh, we are driven as humans to want to explain ourselves. Exactly, and I suppose that's what I'm trying to do. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, another reason I wanted to write the memoir was for my children. Um, when, I, when my mother died, um, I discovered just how much she'd written. I, I knew she was a writer, but I didn't know how much, how many thousands of pages. Did she have them stashed They away? were just stashed in her yeah. filing cabinets and just different places and... My sister Kathy and I discovered them and uh, it was a huge comfort actually because in her writing was her voice mm. and it was like we still had her. And so I started thinking about my own kids and what's going to happen uh, when I'm gone mm. and uh, I wanted to leave them something that had my voice. Well, you've always written but um, have you always thought in, in pictures? Oh, yes, yes. I've always been a very visual thinker. And in a way, when I, when I discovered that a lot of people on the autism spectrum are also visual thinkers, I realised, aha, that's something I have in common with my kids. Mm. Um, and PJ, my husband, also is a visual thinker. So I thought, yeah, wow, that we're not so different. Yeah. You know, and, and it's a way for me to understand them better. You grew up in a, um, uh, a creative household yes. and you've described in, in your book in a beautiful way uh, that, li that kind of circumstance and also the, the, the happy place that your mother tried to make for you with oh, animals. She made and a wonderful home. A yes. Wonderful, yeah, it was a beautiful childhood. I can't complain. Um, <laughs> at, at what stage though did um, what you were writing and what you were seeing and experiencing and you clearly had um, quite a magical imagination, an imagination yes. that went to that went to – uh, the, the mysterious and the, and the magical and the otherworldly. When did that start to coalesce into a desire to actually want to turn that into pictures, moving pictures of some kind? I was oh, quite young, I think. My, um, my mother was a huge, um, a huge influence over me and she, was, she used to take photographs constantly, mm. beautiful photographs on uh, Kodachrome colour slides and we would have these regular slide nights <laughs> Um, I miss slide nights. Uh, slide <laughs> nights where she'd put a sheet up on the wall. Yes. <laughs> and we'd, I would help her. I still remember the smell of the slide projector. Yes. Because, you know, you, it was always getting hotter and hotter. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought it was a magical thing to see huge, huge um, images of uh, us, the family. Yeah. Um, and also landscape. My mother was – we always thought the landscapes were boring. It was like, oh, mum, please, not another <laughs> mountain. But um, I, she had an eye. She had a photographer's eye. And mm. her father was a professional photographer. Mm. Uh, so it was – I don't remember a time when I wasn't staring at big images on a, on a wall. <laughs> and she let you um, use her Super 8 camera? Well, she did. She yeah. was a teacher and I think she was ahead of her time because uh, this was the 1970s but she really worried about the kids who weren't very uh, good at reading and writing mm. and so – she would give them, um, them an opportunity to do a report on something that they were studying um, by doing a movie. <laughs> so she would get, take them out on the weekend and recreate a chapter or a, a moment from the book and I was usually the helper. I'd go along and help her, I'd act in it or, <laughs> you know, and, and then I'd see her editing it with the little splicer and the little cement. Like It smelled like nail polish. Yes. And... Um, I loved it. I just thought, oh, I want to do that. So it was a very young interest. So you, you got the bug really early. I did, but I didn't start making my own narrative films mm. until I was in my teens. Yeah. But I, there's a lovely moment in, in the book where Jocelyn describes um, where you had to send the film away to be developed <laughs> and then you had to – remember yes. those days? And then you had to uh, wait for the film to oh, be yeah. returned to you a in little the mail. yellow envelope. In the yellow envelope, yes. And yeah. um, the, I think there's oh, knowing it, nods in the crowd. It was so magical. Yes. <laughs> I loved it. And then we watched the dailies. Well, they weren't called dailies in those days or rushes. They were called just 
Joss's film mm-hmm. <laughs> and my sister and my f- Oh, that's Kathy and me in New you've Guinea. Got, you've got a fallback just I'm, here, Justin. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> that's Kathy and me in Papua New Guinea. We spent some of our – yeah, I'm the one with the hat. <laughs> the nude is Kathy. She'd be mortified if she was here. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. look how much – how proud she is of her hat. <laughs> and, and yours. Oh, well, my <laughs> hat's amazing. That was mum's hat. I recognise it. Yeah, well, this was about 1964. Well, yeah. you, uh, you and I shared a very similar um, outer eastern suburbs Melbourne life. Yeah. Um, we were born in uh, similar years and I went to Donvale High. You went to Vermont High. Yes, and I did. And I remember Vermont High. I remember a uh, tell of Vermont High when I was at Donvale and um, we knew it to be quite a creative It was school. very creative. Yeah. In fact, that's why my mother whiff, whipped me out of Pembroke High in Moorle Park um, and sent me to Vermont because I was very musical. Right. And Vermont needed a cellist. <laughs> that was it. Just the Jocelyn, one? Jocelyn, you're a cellist. <laughs> well, they, they needed – I don't know. That was her excuse. Maybe she just <laughs> lied to me. Um, you have to go there and be the cellist in the orchestra. Like, what? But I have friends here. It's like, nope. But I think the real reason was, was that Pembroke was an experimental school and – if you could talk, call the teachers by their first name, if you didn't want to study, oh, you that didn't was have my to. school. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So oh, I loved that. Yeah, it was great. I loved it too. It worked but for me. Mum did not. <laughs> Being a very traditional teacher, she's like, "How can I get Joss out of there?" Right. Yeah. And and um, sometimes, well, no, often school can be an exercise in absolute mediocrity, and True. it can and it can. Um, Rather than fire you up, it can extract everything from you and, and leave it yeah. there. Yeah, I think she was worried. Um, but then again, she sent me back to Pembroke when I got beaten up <laughs> by the by school, the school bully. bully. Yes. <laughs> so my safety was more important at that point. But for you, was it a time of coming into your own or not, school? Oh, yeah. Well, I always thought it was a bit of a jail term. But I had great friends and I when I look back, I was very encouraged mm. by certain teachers. You know, one teacher helped me put mm. on a rock opera at the age of 14. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another teacher at Vermont, you know, she was so inspiring. She was the um, orchestra conductor and she um, taught me to compose. So there were very important things that happened mm. for, for my creative development through teachers. And Vermont High had an amazing media teacher. Uh, and she, in when I was there in year 11, she, um, yeah, it's hard to explain. I went back and forth to these schools. Um, and so I was there in year 11 mm. uh, and she taught, she taught an Australian cinema class mm. and that's when I first became aware of the work of um, Peter Weir, who was one of my heroes ever since, and Fred Skepsey, mm. Bruce Beresford, John Digan. Uh, and that was hugely eye-opening to me because it was – Oh, my God, Australia has an industry, yeah. sort of. <laughs> Maybe I can be a – that's a job. I could be a director. And, and that, that clearly lit the spark. And so we'll jump, jump ahead now. And uh, there you are. You've been accepted to the Australian Film, Television and Radio School afters. No small thing being no. accepted to that school. So let's just stop and acknowledge that. Um, and when you arrived there, did you feel like – did you feel you belonged? Oh, yes. I was – so excited. It had been my dream to go there. So, mm. And it was quite a process to get in. Uh, they really made you do a lot of different yes. different sort of trials and tests. Uh, so when I arrived there, I just met a whole bunch of people who were just like me. So it was wonderful. It was, uh, it was like, oh, there you are. All the other people that <laughs> love the same things I do. Beautiful, beautiful. Did you know what you wanted to do straight away or did that yes. take some time? No. no, I didn't. No, I had no idea about what films I was going to make. I no, but I'm, I'm in, I mean, I mean, at, at afters, did you know? I what knew it was I wanted to be a director. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that I was necessarily going to be a writer. Mm. Um, but there was a teacher there who is a writer, quite a prominent Australian um, screenwriter, Keith Thompson, and he um, took me under his wing and mm. said, "You know, you're not just a director; you're a writer. I'm going to push you in that direction." So I ended up doing a double major in writing and directing. Those people that come into walk into your lives oh, that my, way, I yeah, mean, mentors, amazing, yeah. isn't it? When it happens, yeah, I never thought I was a writer. Yeah, but he said you are, and you are. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, now we come to the meet cute, um, as oh, they yes, as they say in the <laughs> Hollywood films, um, and I'd I'd like you to actually just sort of slightly edit this and write this up for us if you can, uh, on the fly here as. 
a meet cute when you um, met a guy uh, born Paul Hogan, but very intelligently changed his name to PJ Hogan because <laughs> who wanted to be always be referred to as that comedian? Um, and and it, and it was a classic meet cute because there was the you know the oh my god it was like it a, went wrong it went right it went wrong it, it went was right. like a it was like a romantic comedy. So describe that romantic Which is comedy. Which PJ's you, least favourite genre. Yes. Oh yeah, right. Even though he makes them, <laughs> but he doesn't watch them. Uh, yes. So you know. Our so life. how did it start? Well, okay, so day one I'm getting to know everyone and, and they're all lovely students and there's this one brat uh, from Queensland. He's only 18 uh, but fiercely intelligent and he's basically insulting people left, right and centre but in a hilarious way, not to their faces, of, about them. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, I'm staying away from him. He is vicious and he's going to, like, I, I just don't want to be near him. Mm-hmm. Scene two. Scene two. Uh we end up hanging out together and he's hilarious and I just can't stop laughing when I'm around him. And strangely enough, I make him laugh because I never thought I was that funny. Mm-hmm. But he says I'm hilarious. And uh, so we became best friends very quickly. We would every spare – if we weren't making films together, we were going to watch marathons at the Valhalla, like three movies in a row, talking about the movies – all right, so I'll keep going. No, um, well, I was going to say, but here's where we introduce, you know, a universal truth, which of course was revealed to us in the um, immortal film where when Harry met Sally, and that is that a man and a woman who are good friends <laughs> cannot be good friends without there being some sexual eventually. desire eventually that gets in the way. <laughs> well, so, yes. Scene three. Yeah, yeah. In, in romantic comedies, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I have plenty of male friends, <laughs> but this one was special. Yeah. So. Um, Scene three, where I'm working on his movie, which became an award-winning short film, Getting Wet. But um, it's uh, – I'm driving him crazy because I'm a really bad continuity person. Yes. <laughs> I keep forgetting to take photos of things like carrots and so the length of the carrot in a scene keeps changing <laughs> and he's getting mad at me and then I'm getting mad at him and we st- I'm just yelling at him. And it's like some, some silly – once again – a mm-hmm. uh, romantic comedy. He's like, why, why are you always angry at me? Uh, his first AD, Jane Campion, has to intervene. Jocelyn, stop yelling at him. It's, it's just really not – he can't direct while you're yelling at him. Um, and I don't know what to do about the two of you. Well, you have to stop arguing. Um, and I'm like, I hate him. And he's like, oh, she drives me crazy, this crazy bitch. And then uh, eventually um, it dawns on me, oh, God, I'm in love with him. <laughs> <laughs> And so I thought, okay, well, this is a problem because I I'm kind of love this other boy. Uh, I've been with Back him for many Melbourne. years. Mm. And I'm actually engaged to this other very lovely young man. Um, what am I going to do? Well, first of all, I better find out how PJ feels because um, I'm not going to risk destroying everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, we were living in a group house then, so, the, you know, student house, three other people. Hard to be alone. Um, I, I say, PJ, could you – actually, he was still Paul then. Paul, could you help me take the garbage out? No. <laughs> he was a bit like that. Oh, come on. You've got to help with the house. So he goes, oh, all right. So we drag the garbage bins up to the – up this steep driveway up to the curb and he's about to go and I go, stop a sec. I have to talk to you about something. <laughs> over see, the garbage. It's what, so romantic. It is over the garbage. And I go, listen, if I told you something – it was really disgusting and horrifying about me. Would you still be, would you still be my friend? And his eyes, he was like, uh, yeah, his poor terrified eyes. I don't know, he probably thought I was going to say I'd killed someone <laughs> or, or, or I was a cannibal or something. Um, anyway, I said, well, now I was supposed to say, I had rehearsed it in my head, I think I'm in love with you. But at the time it just seemed so corny I couldn't say it. I thought I'd act really cool instead and I said, I'd like to have sex with you. <laughs> <laughs> and better. Then, yeah, better. Much better, isn't it? Better. Yeah. I so then his eyes got really big and, <laughs> and really scared. <laughs> that was worrying. And he went, can I think about it? <laughs> well, you imagine how I felt. Oh, no. He flubbed his line. I mean, he flubbed oh, it. Oh, no. And then I said, so are we still friends? And he went, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're still friends. And then he ran off. And I was left horrified all night. What have I done? What have I done? And I've ruined the friendship. Oh, no. We'll never be able to look at each other again. But in the morning he said, "Um, if you meant what you said, I'm all yours. And that was it. 
<laughs> and uh, yes, and he later confessed to me the reason he wanted to think about it because I did ask. Was he, he knew I was engaged and he thought I, that I wanted him to be my last fling before married life. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I didn't want to be a last fling. Ah, it's such a lovely story. And yes, he is embarrassed that I've now put this out, in a, <laughs> put this in a book. It's in print, friends. It can no longer be denied. <laughs> but you know what? It's Everything's fodder in a writer's life. Yeah, absolutely. And he should know that. <laughs> he does. Um, What's the nature of your creative partnership and your creative connection? Can you speak about that or define that in a few words? Uh, we have always worked together. We, that's part of our love, actually, is um, we fell in love with each other as film students. We've always known each other as creative filmmakers and that's kind of what we love about each other, mm. beside a few other things, but um, <laughs> that's... Uh, or we still love talking about movies with each other. That's never gone away after 35 years. And um, we love to work together. Mm. Now, sometimes we fight, of course, but mostly we have a great time supporting each other and, and getting things done. Well, it's interesting because um, it's just a, a common place of gender politics that often in a situation like that there'll be some tension or oh, yeah. you know, difficulty about... Um, who, who's doing what and whose work is doing well. But it seems um, that notwithstanding the, you know, the, the expected squabbles, that actually isn't a feature of your working life. No, we're very proud of each other and yeah. also we are so enmeshed in each other's work yeah. that uh, if something goes well for the other person, it, it, we share it. It feels like, yeah, well... It's my it's a happiness mutual too victory. Yeah. because we've helped each other so much. Mm. And same when things bomb, it's, it's very sad for both of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell me how the project of Proof came to you. Oh, well, I, it came out of my head. Um, I was working as a very junior script editor at Crawford Productions in Box Hill. It was one of my first jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, one of my, uh, you know, besides making coffee for people and getting their lunches and uh, attending script meetings and writing down everyone's ideas as quickly as I could, uh, another job was finding, going through all the newspapers of the day. This is pre-internet, so it's the only way you could mm. do it. Uh, and finding um, ideas for stories for this show I was working on. Um, and some of these stories had to be big, important stories and some of them had to be quirky, unusual stories. So I was looking through, I think it was the Herald or maybe the Age and there was an odd spot. I think it was actually called Odd Spot. That's the Age, that's the Age's yes. Odd Spot. Do they yep. still have the Odd Spot? Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, there it was. There was a young man, uh, kind of obviously vision impaired, but he's got a camera and it said Bruce somebody, um, can't remember his last name, uh, has an interesting hobby. You know, he's, he's been blind since birth and yet he loves photography. And that was about it. Didn't say much else. And uh, I cut that out and I was like, I wonder what I could do with this. Mm. Um, but it, it just, I thought, no, it's not going into prime time, which was about a current affairs team <laughs> <laughs> and sort of a soapy version. Yeah. Um, so I tucked it away and I kept looking at it and thinking about him. And then I heard about an, a separate photographer who was also but he'd lost his vision but he he also took photographs so then I started thinking why on earth would someone who can't see what why would they do that <laughs> and the more I thought about it the more I started thinking perhaps it's a way a method of proof mm. of what they're hearing and sensing with the senses they do have their five senses no four senses <laughs> um helps them understand the sense they don't have mm. that other people seem to have. So they, they, they're aware they don't have a sense that most other people have and they're trying to gain an understanding of it. And so I realised it was a good metaphor for trust because there are some people who can't trust. It's, um, I'm sure you've, you've seen it. If you haven't, you have to. Um, it's a terrific film. It's a great bit of writing and, um, and a perfect portrait of what Jocelyn, I think, does so well, which is takes you into, um, it's character driven and takes you into the psychological place and motivations of the people she's interested in. Um, but always wrapped around that is um, emotion. 
and the you know the 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 strong sort of ebbs and flows and mm. the, the smacks and and surfing waves of emotion and and the yeah. the risks within that mm. um, was the writing process of it enjoyable was it an, an easy well, I loved write it. I loved well no it was a long write actually um, but it was it was quite it was easy in that I was always inspired to get to sort of knuckle down and. Mm. Try and think of fascinating conversations between Martin and um, yes. Andy, and then of course once I thought of Celia, uh, the cruel and very strange housekeeper who's sexually obsessed with Martin. Yes. <laughs> I had a ball. You had your story. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yes, yes. So, uh, and of course PJ was helping me along the way because originally I wanted to do it as a short film, mm. and I remember going along to Film Victoria, uh, hoping they'd fund my short film. And when I went in there, there's Natalie Miller and um, oh, yes. <laughs> and a bunch of other people. And they say, now, Jocelyn, we just want to – now, sit down. We want to talk to you about this. Um, we, we're we not going to fund it as a short film. Of course, I go blind with – with <laughs> blind, ironically. My, <laughs> my, my head just starts swirling. It's like, mm. they've rejected me. That's it. I'm never going to make this film and I'm on the verge of tears. And they proceed to tell me that if I can turn this into a 90-minute script – um, they'll fund it as a feature. But I don't really hear that bit. <laughs> I just walk out, storm out, crying. <laughs> PJ's waiting for me in the waiting room and he's like, oh, what happened? What, were they horrible to you? What happened? And then I tell him through between sobs what happened and then he goes, oh, stop crying, you silly woman. <laughs> they, <laughs> they want to give you just, a feature they, film. They want to give you a feature <laughs> film, you mad woman. And then I, oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know if we have any images of proof we may or oh, may not no, have. Oh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, you probably have them in your mind anyway. But um, but the casting of proof really was something else, wasn't it? Well, yes. Um, take, I, take, I, take us through them. We should, okay. we should name those. There's Hugo glory. Weaving, mm-hmm. who was 29 at the yeah. time, or maybe 30, same age as me actually. Um, he was 30 then. Uh, Russell Crowe, age 24, and Heather Mitchell and Genevieve, Genevieve Pico. Pico. Yeah. An incredible cast. It was cast. a forehander, really. Wasn't yeah, it, it was. Um, did you know who you wanted? I knew. I only knew I wanted Genevieve because right. I'd seen her in some theatre, in some plays, and I thought, I love that woman. I must work with her. Uh, whereas, I mean, she was my only choice, actually. Uh, whereas with uh, Martin, I didn't know. Mm. Um, I had a. I had one guy in mind, but he was all wrong, um, and. It was Linda who said, "I think we should open it up and and let's let's audition people for this." And people and Greg Apps was my uh, casting guy, and he said, well, "How about Hugo Weaving?" I'm like, "No, Hugo's been in too much. He's been in the, all these Kennedy Miller miniseries. He's not right for this. You know, he's so handsome, <laughs> and he's just no, he's debonair and completely wrong." And it was my good friend Heather Mitchell who said, um, "Joss, I know Hugo, and he's perfect for this." Uh, and I'm like, no, he's not. She said, just meet him, please. Just meet the guy and give him a test. And I finally said, all right, to make you happy, I will. And uh, Hugo came in and uh, was wearing a ghastly, colourful jumper, sort of like a Ken Don oh, horror. No. <laughs> but uh, Ken Don gone really wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and um, hand-knitted, I believe. <laughs> and uh, he was... His hair was wet from the rain and he just sort of came in in a sort of nervous mess um, and then sat down and was just so commanding and said my lines, which was a shocking, amazing moment. And I could just feel my heart go, well, it's him. It's totally him. You, you describe that through the book. There's a, a chord. There you is. This, it's like I like get a, a chord. My a, heart gets some, plucked. Yes. <laughs> in your heart when you know that's that's the yes. right actor. If I have a harp in my heart yeah <laughs> somebody goes ping um and you um you created your first feature film at the same same time as you created your first child i know we, we <laughs> yes <laughs> there's I a lot of that. birthing going on um yes yes well i just found out my my buddy um christina posen was the producer at that point and we were getting we were very excited because um both film vic film victoria and uh what was then called the film financing corporation later to become Screen Australia, had committed to fund it fully. Uh, it was going to cost us exactly $1 million. Uh, I couldn't believe it was true. And then I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was pretty amazing too. I was not expecting that. And I was thrilled but also convinced I had to choose. 
And I just assumed that's it, no film. I won't, I'll never be a director because, of course, I want this baby. I love. I want to be a mum. And uh, beautifully, I was wrong. Christina called them up and said, uh, s- slight uh, spanner in the works, Jocelyn's pregnant and can't really go into directing this film this year. And they said, well, we'll just hold the money for it. We'll wait, which was mm. – I thought someone else would get it. Mm. Um, but, no, they waited for me. But Christina, unfortunately, could not wait. She had to earn a living and uh, she went and took some other work. And then in the meantime, Linda House um, found me. Mm. And, uh, well, yeah, that we, we went on to do Muriel's Wedding together as well. So um, that's that was a, a, And then we're very close friends to this day. Yeah, a, a great creative partnership, that. What's your, um, what's your directing process like? What do you like when you're on set? Very calm, actually. People, I, I mean, I, I never really thought about what I was like on set, except people now tell me that I'm very calm on mm-hmm. set. Um, and, uh, but very determined. I, I mean, I, I know what I want and I'll keep going till I get it, but well, I won't be insane about it. Well, I heard this. I heard the oh, there's stubborn- me on <laughs> quilt. <laughs> there's yes. the determined look. There's a determined look. Um, yes. <laughs> I heard the stubbornness in your voice before when you had, you know, smart people telling you, for God's sake, just meet Hugo Weaving. Yeah, that's And right. you had in your mind that you wouldn't. Um, yes. So does, I that, am does, that, does that stubbornness um, allow for collaboration? Of or does co- it? Yes, yes, mm-hmm. it does. I love, that's, I love uh, the team. Uh, Experience. I love working with a crew. I, yeah. I adore film crews you'd, and you'd, actors. You'd, you'd have to love that or you just wouldn't go into that line of work at all, Oh, would no, you? you'd be crazy. You, yeah. No. If you're not... But I, no, if, but I think there are some directors who do that, I mean, who nonetheless want to make films but, you know, really resent the whole... Right. And I've got all these fucking and people around to me to too people. sort of thing. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like talking to people, yeah. so that's okay. And I love hearing their ideas and I love... Um, I've had some great experiences, you know, working with the camera people and the production designer. I love all that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's good because you delegate. You go, I'm going to choose you because you're brilliant. (laughs) And then they, and then they, um, yeah, they, they show you that yes, indeed they are brilliant. Well, Proof was a smash success and celebrated and, and awarded and the baby was a smash success. Oh, little, yes, his name was Dow. Yes. Oh, don't ask me why. (laughs) <laughs> we were first-time parents and the great actor, Frank Gallagher, no longer with us, uh, but he was a good buddy of ours in those days and he said, you've got to give him a Celtic name, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and you know how obedient I am when it comes to really uh, uh, intimidating actors. I'm like, yes, <laughs> you're right, we will. We'll give him a Celtic name. And so Dow means, it's actually pronounced Doch. <laughs> And it means you're boy, really cursing this boy child, with black you? hair and blue eyes, which he had when he was born. Yes, he still has the blue eyes, but his hair's more. He went on to change melting. his name. Oh, he as soon as he could. Yes, yeah. <laughs> he changed he it to Spike. Briefly tell that story <laughs> about he he did he was what th- four? Okay, yes, How he was four was he? years old. We'd moved to America. A precocious boy, he was, but very bright. We'd moved to America, and the Americans first of all couldn't understand his Australian accent. <laughs> They're like, what, what? And then they're like, what is your name? And he'd say, it's Dowie. And they'd go, that's a terrible name. It's, you know, it's got we in it. Yeah. And it sounds, Dowie, like, it yeah. sounds like you're a cow. And he, so he immediately changed it. And I, one day I went to pick him up. He was in, well, I guess it's pre-K. And, the, and everyone's going, bye, Spike, bye, Spike. And uh, the teacher goes, don't forget his lunchbox. And it's got Spike written on it. <laughs> I went, no, no, this must be somebody else's. Ah, uh, No. He's changed his name. What do you mean he's changed his name? We can't do that. Well, he has. And, uh, and so in the car ride home, uh, Dowie, I'm not, that's not my name. Okay, so your name's Spike now? Yes. I went, um, well, maybe we'll just try it out. No, no, it's my name. And then we get home and I tell PJ, you know, he's, you know uh, Dowie, stop saying that name. <laughs> okay, he's changed his name to Spike. And, and then he made, he stood up and he puffed out his little chest and he said, Dowie, is gone, I have torn it up into a thousand pieces. And then he pointed at me, and you will not stick them together again. <laughs> I went, okay, that's fine. I love that. I love that story so much. <laughs> I, I, I love the phrases that children of that age come up with, you know, that the, 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 the commanding language, pieces, you know, yes. that they can, <laughs> when they really feel something, it's a so great So he's been yarn. Spike ever since. And funnily enough, I remember he loved that, animated movie um 
Land Before Time. Oh, yeah. And I hadn't been paying much attention to that movie until one day I saw that it was actually the Stegosaurus, his favourite dinosaur, was called Spike. Uh huh. And I was in, I was actually working with Steven Spielberg at the time. And I was in his office, and there on the wall was an anima- was a framed cell from Land Before Time. And I remember I was talking to him, and then I, my eyes zeroed in on the Stegosaurus. And then it, it hit me while I'm having a meeting with Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and I went, oh, I've just realised why my, why my son changed his name to Spike. <laughs> and I told him the story, and uh, he ended up giving me that. That frame, but with a lo- he wrote a lovely thing on it to Spike. Tell us what he it did. says. Read the bottom. He wrote, "Take it easy on your mum, Spike." <laughs> <laughs> Such a great story. I know it was gorgeous. Um, and and well, meetings with Steven Spielberg yes. and offers all flowed from the fact that Proof was. Um, he were, loved it. Was such he a huge it. success. Yeah, he, yeah. Uh, my I got an agent. I got two agents actually. Um, William Morris Agency, uh, in. Um, can at the Cannes Film Festival, mm. which was just a dream come true. Yeah. I just felt like I was in some kind of weird dream universe. Didn't seem real. Um, that you know my films screening and I'm uh, being standing f- ovations. Standing ovations. I'm being fated everywhere. People want to meet with me. It's just me. I'm like, what? This is insane. Um, and then these agents said, we're going to show proof to as many pe- producers in Hollywood as we can. And they did. They showed them, showed it to him and also Sidney Pollack. And um, I got offers to work with both of them. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was amazing. And meanwhile, Lina and I were producing, we're getting ready to make Muriel's wedding. So that, that parallel life was going on as well yeah. because PJ was working on a, a, another, you know, immortal Australian film. Yes. Uh, which has had many lives and now lives as a stage show as well. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes. And it, it, so all this, when this is going on and you're, you know, moving to America and getting these offers, um, your working lives are still completely enmeshed in a way, aren't they? Totally. You've, you've got parallel yes. projects but projects that, you know, oh, sort yes, of join yes. together. Yeah. Yes, very much so. Um, I loved Muriel's wedding. It was it was like another child for us. Mm. And uh, for so for him to get that going finally... Uh, and a very and then, personal story for and him. And a very personal story because, you know, I knew a lot of the people he'd based the characters on. His family. They were his family, mm. yeah. It was a loving but angry portrait mm. of his Very childhood. dysfunctional family. Yeah. yeah, of his childhood growing up in on the Gold Coast with, yeah, with a dysfunctional family, mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the catch-all <laughs> phrase that lightly. we use, yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you must have felt like you were just on top of the world. We did, it was amazing. And then PJ went on to make My Best Friend's Wedding, which, of course, he, idiot, thought was going to be a disaster. And I'd seen it and I went, it's not going to be a disaster, darling. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan of romantic comedies either. <laughs> but that one. That's that one, gorgeous. That's that the one. one that, you know, um, I went to the cinema and I saw it and I loved it. But, you know, when you're flicking through, it's Friday night, just give me, oh, <gasps> excellent. It's I will so gorgeous. always stop and I, wherever yeah. wherever it is, wherever we are in the movie, I will stop and I will well, watch it through quirky. to the end. it's quite quirky. It's yeah. quite unusual. It's very quirky. In, in a way, similar to Muriel's Wedding. Yeah, it's, it's got it's that but, Australian It does what you don't expect. Mm. And uh, it gives you a weird ending that you weren't expecting, but it seems satisfying. So, um, yeah, it's, so we just – that was hugely successful, much to his shock. <laughs> and uh, he'd But s- delight, uh, well, I assume. No, I think he was just so shocked. <laughs> He hid. He was con- so convinced it was going to be okay. a disaster. He made us all go down to Australia while it opened. He wanted to get far away. <laughs> so we went to visit relatives. Um, so you missed the great opening We missed success. everything. Oh, God. Silly boy. Yes. Um, but we were invited back and uh, <laughs> Sony Pictures gave us a three-year deal, officers, staff. We didn't know what to do with them. We were like, but we, we can't write here. <laughs> And you, um, you had offers and, and projects, How to Make an American Quilt, yes. I mentioned before. I'm going to jump ahead again and, um, and reference an article that was written in the New York Times that you mentioned. <laughs> and this is a leap ahead. Well, this is after um, autism uh, struck. Yeah. After, but uh, I mention it as a way of – so we can talk about that and then we can go back and okay. actually place <laughs> that in time because um, – Jocelyn is on top of the world and is getting every project you can possibly imagine um, and then life changes. So just tell us about this little article that was written by okay. Elvis. Elvis Mitchell. Elvis Mitchell. He's a very prominent um, critic, still mm. is, for the New York Times. He might have just retired 
but back then, he, you know, everybody read him. Mm. And uh, I had been not working for quite a few years and about five years actually at this point and my agent at CAA thought it would be lovely. She, she, she found this article in the New York Times which was – the title was Whatever Happened to Jocelyn Morehouse? <laughs> and, um, she thought it would be a nice thing to send to you. Well, she thought I'd like it um, <laughs> because it's Elvis Mitchell talking about proof and it was a love letter to proof. Mm. And it was saying – because it, it had had quite a, quite a success in New York. Mm. Uh, people seemed to love it there and it ran for quite a long time at the Angelica Cinema and it, it, it was, a, it was a screened at the New York New Filmmakers uh, Festival and so it had got a lot of attention there. And uh, he wanted to know what had happened to me. He said, did she fall off the planet? Um, and then he went on to say she had so much potential but she's gone and uh, – this goes to show you can't, you know, an interesting filmmaker can easily... She must have been crushed by Hollywood. And um, I was really upset. Mm. <laughs> and I actually wrote him a letter, you know, because I wanted him to know. I'm not... I haven't fallen off the, uh, the planet. Um, Hollywood has not crushed me. I'm simply being a mother. And my children are disabled and I, I'm trying to look after... Actually, it was just one autistic kid at that time. And... Uh, he never answered me and I feel kind of embarrassed that I felt I had to explain no, myself. No, I'm, I'm, gla I'm glad you sent that. <laughs> because, yes, because life, life had changed. You, changed. you um, had a second child and um, as all parents do with a child when around about 12 months, 13 months, you start to suspect something's not quite mm. right. And yeah. then there's that um, tunnel that you go through in order to... Find out, am I mad? Is, is there something am wrong? Am I imagining it? Am I making yeah. this up? Are they all wrong? Is, is the, the mother's kid instinct. wrong? Am I wrong? Yeah. Yes, well... And you were right. I was right. There was something wrong. And um, Lily... We're talking here about Lily. Well, yes. yes. Lily was a absolutely beautiful little girl. Um, pretty as a picture. Uh, looked like Snow White out of the fairy tales. You know, black hair. White skin with little rosy cheeks, <laughs> big brown eyes. Um, but she, at, at 13 months, which is usually when autism strikes, around 13 months. Now, autism has been there from the beginning, but it hasn't revealed itself yet. Because it is genetic, it's there. But what happens is there's certain stepping stones that a baby has to go through, developmental things that happen in the brain. And if one of those little steps is slightly skew if then it won't the brain will not go along the normal path it'll go well I'll just go over here now <laughs> and it's after a while of the brain going off on its own direction and it, it can be a very esoteric direction mm. it's each each case of autism is different because each brain will be autistic in a different way mm. um so I, the way I noticed was that Lily was no longer speaking. She'd only had a few words, but the words she had were atypical. They were not normal toddler words. Uh, instead of mama, dada, bottle, up, up. Uh, more, which are usually the first few mm. and maybe cat, <laughs> mm. she was saying yellow, uh, butterfly, pretty, uh, flamingo. <laughs> but not mama and not dada. Mm. Uh, and she wasn't pointing. That's another thing to look mm. for because that's the very first, you know, that's one of the first baby communication tools. And so um, I just, all I knew at that point, because I wasn't even thinking of autism, I just thought something's wrong. Uh, and then it was my very good paediatrician who wasn't afraid to say, well, she was afraid to say the A word, autism, but she did say, you should get her hearing checked out because when I say Lily, she doesn't look at me. And I started going, you know, at home trying that out. Lily, Lily, and she wouldn't look. Mm. But if I turned Barney the dinosaur on, she could be three rooms away and she'd come running. So I already knew she wasn't deaf. But they do make you go through that first because that's usually the most common reason for language delay is hearing issues. Um, but her hearing was fine and um, I remember... <laughs> the lady at the audiologist, she came, she came out and said, no, her hearing seems to be fine, but here's some paperwork. And I looked at the paperwork and it said, regional centre, um, special needs children. And I'm like, what, what's this for? 
And she looked a bit stricken and said, uh, just talk to your paediatrician. And what it was was a referral to get her assessed for all the developmental delays. Mm. And she didn't have the guts to say, oh, we think your kid might have developmental delays. And that happens a lot in the beginning. People don't want to be the one to tell you. Mm. And um, luckily I the internet had arrived and I was um, very – uh, I taught myself very quickly how to use search engines and um, I looked up her symptoms and autism kept shouting back at me mm. from the computer screen, which made me feel sick and kept me awake at night. But at least I could say to people, do you think she's autistic? And they'd have to give me an answer. Mm. And they would say, well, she could be, but we don't want to say that yet. <laughs> Why not? It'll help me know what to do. But I went to UCLA where there was a developmental specialist and she's the first one who used the word autism in her report. She said she has autistic tendencies, tendencies. which meant she was walking on her tippy toes. Who knew? Who knew that was a sign? Um, that she uh, was exceptional at puzzles b above her age group um, but didn't look at you and didn't imitate. Mm. Big, big warning sign if they don't imitate you. Mm. Uh, yeah, and that's that's when it began the journey of how do we help Lil? How do we help her? And um, and in the book you describe, and um, it's you'll you'll read it when you read the book. It's uh, it's exhausting. Um, it's all encompassing and consuming, and sometimes defeating. And it's a yes, it the, is the word the word challenging doesn't cover it because it's a it's a lonely it's a lonely place well, to I be well i felt very lonely yes um i was trying to be strong for the whole family sure that's your job yes <laughs> and so uh i i mean pj was very supportive but he he decided early on that he needed to be the breadwinner because now we were going to be a single um there weren't going to be both of us working yeah. uh and the therapy was not covered by insurance, so we had to pay for it all ourselves. Yeah. And it's very, very, very expensive. And um, But at the early days, it was just trying to work out what to do. Uh, all the snake oil merchants came out of the woodwork. Yeah. Oh, this cures it, this cures it, this cures it. Oh, read this story. Oh, yeah, I cured my son doing this. And, of course, I read everything. Mm. Um, but uh, – and meanwhile, I'm being told by people, oh, you're well, she may never talk. And she may never know who you are, and she may never love you, and she might. End, you'll probably end up in an institution. All wrong. By All the way. wrong. <laughs> but I didn't know that then. I was yeah. terrified. Yeah, sure. Um, and it wasn't that I was terrified about her being autistic. I was. Well, yeah, I suppose I was actually. <laughs> but it was more. I was terrified. I wasn't the right mother. How on earth am I? I don't know anything about mm. teaching someone with autism. How am I going to do this? And she had some really challenging behaviours, which made yes, it she did. She very would, hard um, in the household. Like a lot of autistic kids, the lack of language um, and any kind of communicative ability makes them deeply frustrated. Mm. And that frustration leads to really extreme behaviours. And in her case, it was violence towards herself and me. Um, it was poo smearing it was hitting her head against the walls and playing with her own blood um it was not sleeping it was waking up all the time and screaming um and it was very hard to comfort her mm. so getting her to stop screaming so that spike could sleep and the neighbors wouldn't call the police was was a nightly um job mm. i got a rocking chair and i would just rock her mm. and she didn't want to be held so i had to keep her this way facing out and just rock and rock and rock and sing. I used to sing to her. Mm. She liked that. So I would sing fairy tales, anything I think, could think of. Lullabies my mum had sung me, uh, anything. And she'd go to sleep finally. And then one night I heard her singing. I heard her singing the songs that I sung. She couldn't speak yet but she could sing Twinkle Star. And that's yeah. a connection. That's uh -huh, a connection. Yes, I realised that's mm. a connection. Mm. And... Her speech therapist said, I told her, of course, it was the big news, and the speech therapist said, oh, well, you know, music has been uh, shown to bypass the language centre. It's, it's a way to trick people who have language problems in the brain. It bypasses words so you can teach them. It's like stutterers or um, 
stroke victims who mm. use music mm. with words in it and they can learn, they can sing to you but yes. they can't talk. Yeah. Yeah, and we did teach her a lot that way. PJ's working um, hard. He's, yes. he's got projects. You're in America when this yes. is um, going on and um, then you fall pregnant again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, we worked our butts off with um, Lily. We, we were doing ABA therapy with Dr Lovas, uh, which is an amazing therapy. Mm. It basically breaks down what a child needs to learn into teachable steps. Mm. What a normal child would would learn naturally because their brain is wired, wired to, to do, do that. that. Yeah. Uh, you have to actually spoon feed them mm. and eventually they learn how to learn. And she did eventually. She learned to speak and um, do a lot of things. Mm. Um, and, I, and she definitely loves me. I'm not in any doubt of that. Uh, but yes, so what happened was she was uh, she was probably we how many years had we been at it? <laughs> I guess about eight years. Uh, look at them. That's actually Jack and Maddie, my youngest, um, on our tip a typical walk around Santa Monica. <laughs> um, so yes, I fell pregnant with Jack. Um, we were down here in Qu at Queensland. Uh, filming the hugely gigantic Peter Pan, we took over yes. about eight sound stages, stages yeah. on, at the Gold Coast. It yeah. was extraordinary. Spike was in his element. Can you imagine? He's 12 years old and he's helping us and make Peter Pan. his dad is making Peter Pan. Yeah. It's like a dream come true. He pretty true. much did it for Spike because <laughs> he was like, I don't know about this. I'm like, you have to do it. <laughs> this will make Spike happy. He's been through autism all these years. <laughs> Give him something to be happy about. Um, so, uh, we were down, we were all down. I'd had to bring therapists with us. I had to mm -hmm. train local people how to be Lily's therapist. And I'm doing second unit directing on the film, uh, and producing it with a few scary American producers. And, um, yeah, I found out, I realized uh, how on earth did that happen? But somehow it did. Um, <laughs> we were under so much stress. So as soon as I found out I was having a, a baby and a baby boy, I was afraid because autism is a lot more likely to occur in a boy than a girl, three times more common in boys. Mm. Uh, I went on this research frenzy, how to avoid autism. Um, you know, it's, it's all magical thinking. You can't avoid it if mm. it's in your genes. It's just luck. Um, I uh, put myself on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet because I'd heard that might help. Um, I uh, stayed incredibly Clean, clean, clean uh, diet, no alcohol. Well, you, we don't do that anyway. But um, then when he, was when he was born, I refused to vaccinate him because I had fallen into the um, belief. The Wakefield lie. Well, actually, yeah. Now, wake the Wakefield, Dr Wakefield came out with this heavily, we didn't know at the time, but it was a heavily um, flawed report mm. that Lily's diagnosis had just happened and then I – hear this news yeah. um it's all your fault mum because you you vaccinated your kid mm. or it could be the fillings in your teeth i did both <laughs> <laughs> and um so there's like a whole generation of women of that age going oh my god i did this to my mm. child um so of course i thought even if it was it was starting to be disputed mm. but i was still too scared so I, I didn't vaccinate jack um all my kids are vaccinated now because i know it's not true mm. um but uh he still developed autism. So I jokingly said to all my friends, well, I did the test, didn't I? <laughs> you know, I didn't vaccinate him. He stayed off dairy and, and uh, gluten and he still became autistic. So I think I know the answer to that one. Um, and, yes, we were um, down here in Sydney when I – and my film Eucalyptus had just crashed uh, three days before filming – you know, in a way, it was lucky that it did, even though it was incredibly painful at the time uh, because I was home and I noticed that Jack was doing this. He was a, about 12 months and I noticed he was doing these strange things. Uh, he, he was, there was a little air vent. There were two air vents uh, for ducted heating uh, in this house we were renting in Tamarama and I noticed the little cutie pie was going from one air vent to another. And I just started watching him like, well, I wonder what he's doing. And then he kept doing it. And I instantly my autism 
flags went, oh, my God, no, no. Another so one. I picked him up, put him on my lap, um, read a book to him, uh, played with him, put him down. He went straight back to the fence and he did this back and forth for, I think, 15 minutes while I'm just mortified and I knew then because hmm. autistic kids look for patterns. They hmm. love patterns like, oh, these two are the same. I could look at this for hours. Yeah. Um, Yes. So I took, yeah, I found out he was autistic too. And we went back to America to the, where all our specialists were. Hence the letter to Mr. Elvis. So I was, uh, <laughs> I, I've been a little busy, Mr. Elvis. <laughs> I'm a little busy, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you write about that so movingly in the book. And, and, and for me, the, the most powerful thing uh, in a, a series of, of very, very moving and emotionally affecting stories and experiences is when you um, – that moment where you realise that, you know, you don't want to change your children. You don't want to – Well, you know, it's been a long time now. It's been um, – Jack is 15. I think I have a picture of Jack now if you want to find it. <laughs> uh, he is uh, 15, beautiful, still an incredibly um, loving, uh, cuddly – and creative. Mm. He makes collages. I think I put some Jack's art. If you want to put up Jack's art, I'm Did very it. proud of him. <laughs> he taught himself how to cut uh, simply because he wanted to cut out pictures and put them in collages. And mm. I had to teach him how to use a glue stick because he was using – it was kind of amazing. I almost didn't want to teach him because he would get the little leftover bits around stickers and he would stick his pictures onto things oh, that way. And so that, we'd yeah. have these incredible mosaics. Yes. And the first time he did it – Oh, there's one of his artworks. Yeah. And see how he's grabbed some of Dad's writing. Dad's got some, I don't know what that is. Anyway, like he'll grab things that we're working on and he likes to incorporate them. See, there's a little bit of an outside of a sticker there. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, do you have any other pictures? I'm so proud. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it was when we were doing uh, – PJ and I were getting ready to do uh, The Dressmaker and we were doing mood boards and picking up – we were cutting mm. out pictures of beautiful vintage frocks and sticking them up or we were doing screenshots. There he is. There's Jack doing – he also does sculptures. He likes to grab things. Look, there's a measuring tape, um, a dinosaur and Christmas decoration all being wrapped together. Um, and I think I and, and Jack, art, Jack anyway. started sticking up animals on, he your, did. Uh, mood, he on your mood up, boards. I, yes. Yeah, I, we went out for lunch, came back. And I'm, look, I'm trying to show uh, Don McAlpine now. See this still from the Night of the Hunter? And then I go, wait a minute, there's a lion in it. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw this picture of a lion stuck with little stickers. And I realised we'd inspired him. And ever since then, he uh, cuts things out. Um, it was so funny. We even had a model of, the, of Dungata that we'd made to work out how we were going to build the, the town. In town. The and yes. once again, we went off for lunch, came back and there was like a herd of dinosaurs <laughs> going, going down the main the street. So it was just gorgeous. Our so. time has got away with this, but before we finish, if we can just very quickly, I did want to ask you about two projects. One is The Dressmaker, but one you've referenced already, Eucalyptus. Mm. Um, and the crashing of that film, yes. as, um, as I understand it, over um, uh, Russell Crowe's demands to want to change the script and to have much more influence than perhaps you would want – um, an actor to have even if he had a producer credit um, for, on a director. Um, is that project salvageable ever? I do constantly ask about it. Well, at least once a year. Who has the rights to it? Fox has uh -huh. the rights. But Fox has just been bought by Disney. So I know. who knows? Yeah. Now, we, we, my agents, uh, we, we don't give up. Okay. Uh, I don't give up. Because you have the script. Well, I don't own the rights to the script anymore. Mm, okay. We'd have to make a deal with... Um, with Fox probably right. because it went into – it's it's got money on it, owing on it. Right. Uh, the money that was spent in pre-production yeah. uh, was $8 million and um, we'd have to somehow incorporate that. Can you ever forgive Russell Crowe for being yes. instrumental in of course. crushing that? Yeah, because um, I, I look at the irony. Uh, it, was, it did devastate me. Um, it was – it was a – it was a difference of opinions over how the script should go. Mm. I don't think um, he meant me harm at all. I think he thought he was trying to to make it good. Mm. Um, 
but I also didn't want to change it. And, um, you know, these things do happen, it, sadly, in films all the time. And unfortunately, when there's a lot of money involved, it's a, it's a huge – it's like there's a little bit of a, something on the Richter scale because yeah. people lose their jobs. And, uh, you know, the house that we built, um, the Janet Patterson, the late Janet Patterson – designed I mean it's the most gorgeous house that Holland was going to live in it's still there on the farm where we built it because waiting I mean, for you well the, yes it is <laughs> there were cows living in it for a while because it was just a set and it was going to fall apart but um one of the crew I didn't know this I only found out two years ago by by chance one of the crew was loved that house so much they made a deal with the farmer and said um, if I do it up yeah. so it's livable, yeah. can I live there? And he said, okay. So <laughs> someone's living there. That's it's fantastic. still there. It's a workable house now. Ah, well, I, I see that as just a moment in time then waiting to be seized. <laughs> Hopefully because like, like I'm sure – it makes me happy to think that. Yeah, but I'm yeah. sure like many people here that Murray Bale book is it's a so book. magnificent. I haven't given up. And I'm hoping I can get it going it's, one It's day. potentially a great Australian film and I'm, I'm sure your script would have been beautiful. Um, and then we sh I really want to talk even briefly about The Dressmaker. We probably have some images to show there. Oh, yeah, we do have some behind because the scenes Because what, um, yeah. what a great success The Dressmaker was. Yes, um, and so Congratulations much and so Thank much you. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and a great bit of writing from you and then the whole thing just worked I know. <laughs> how, how, how amazing is that? Well, you know. You wanted it, Kate it was, Winslet from the beginning for I that. I wanted Kate. Yep. Oh, look, there's darling Sasha. Um, I, I managed to get the jewels of the Australian um, acting world. You did indeed. Into, uh, into my film. You got your friends back together I again. I got a lot of my mates back together. Mm -hmm. um, it was beautiful because there were a lot of people who'd worked with me before mm. and were so happy to see me back in the director's chair that mm. I felt really loved and and very welcomed yeah. and supported right down to gaffers. You know, that <laughs> sorry, gaffers are the electricians um, and their assistants would be the best boys. That's me talking to Don McAlpine, legendary cinematographer. Legendary cinematographer uh, in Australia. Yes, he was a joy to work with. He had worked on two films I'd produced. He worked on Peter Pan and on Mental. Mm. So we we were already friends, but he was really thrilled to have me as a director instead of a, a producer. And you know he's great; he's done so many wonderful Aussie movies. Uh, yeah, so um, it was great. And uh, yeah, Kate was. I had to go, and um, I couldn't quite believe it when Kate Winslet said yes. I actually said, "Well, I'm getting on a plane, and I'm coming over to England to look you in the eye <laughs> and make sure you mean it." And she just laughed. But I, that, I did that. Yes. I, cashed, I got all my frequent flyer points and I got on the plane because <laughs> it was so important to me. It had been 18 yeah. years. Mm. Well, at that point, 17. Uh, and I said, now we're really doing this, right? And she goes, yes, darling, we're really doing this. And then she got pregnant. And then she got pregnant. <laughs> but, you know, that seems to happen. That, that seems to happen a lot. Women. But the film was made. And, um, oh, and, and there's was, PJ there's helping PJ, out. Yes. And was uh, so well received and a huge success. Yeah. And the audience laughed in the right places and cried in the right places. It was a joy, a joy to make and a joy to watch it with an audience. Yeah. Because they loved it. Yeah. What's next for you, Jocelyn? Uh, well, I'm very busy being um, a television director at the moment. So I'm doing a mini series for the ABC called Les Norton. I'm the setup director, which means I get to do the casting and setting up of the world. Uh, so I'm still editing the second mm. episode. Then I'm going out to the South Australian desert to work on the new Kate Blanchett. Um, she's the producer, but she's yes, also so in it. Uh, she, it's called that, Stateless. That's, that's the, um, the immigration TV series. Yeah. yeah. It looks amazing. Yeah. But I still have dreams also. I want to make the film I've been trying to make for a while, but it's just – it's an expensive film. It's a period film. It's about Clara Schumann. Um I think I have an image of Clara Schumann. Um, wife of. Wife of Robert Schumann mm. um, and muse of Johannes Brahms. Beautiful mm. musical um, love story uh, set in the 1850s about an exceptional woman that, who had to deal with a hell of a lot. I love the sound of that one. <laughs> and that brings together all of your interests there. You've got yes, music, you've got writing, the whole lot and there love, she of is. course. That's Clara in the middle and look at Johannes Brahms. He's, so, he's a spunk. That's, that's, in, that's Viggo Mortensen, I think, isn't uh, oh, it? Oh, that there? could be good. That's yeah. Robert Schumann yeah. on the right. <laughs> yeah, so they both loved her. She married Robert, but 
Brahms pined for her his whole life. <laughs> um, I've uh, eaten into our question time in the audience, but, you know, tough. I'm the one sitting here with the microphone, so <laughs> I get to do that. But um, will you please thank Jocelyn for a marvellous conversation. <laughs> And um, we have five minutes or so for questions. If you have any burning questions to ask, there's a thousand things I didn't get to. Wait till the microphone gets to you. Keep your questions brief or I will <laughs> cut you down. <laughs> oh. I will. That's scary. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, talking, coming. Um, could you talk a bit about A Thousand Acres and the casting? Oh, sure. Um, a Thousand Acres... Uh, it's a Jane Smiley book and I was lucky enough to be offered uh, the job of directing that. Now, it was um, produced and starring, uh, produced by and starring um, Jessica Lang and Michelle Pfeiffer. They were, it was their idea to do it and they hired me. <laughs> and uh, in the book, you'll, if you read it, um, <laughs> you'll see that it was somewhat painful for me. Um, hi, Ali. <laughs> and uh, I, um, uh, I had a hard time on that one um, because I didn't have enough time to shoot it and uh, it was not – it was just so painful for me as a director because I had to do it very quickly and that's not how I like to do things. Um, I was still relatively young. I've now learned sometimes you can do things very quickly. So I often think about that experience and go, hmm, I wonder if there's a way I could have made it less painful to work on. But I did enjoy making it. Um, I've always loved King Lear as a as a story and as, as the whole dysfunctional family uh, that Shakespeare created there, very interesting dynamic between the father and his three daughters. And I got to, I got to work with Jason Robards and Colin Firth who are extraordinary well, Jason's gone now, but, yeah, mm. extraordinary actors. Um, also with um, – uh, I've forgotten his first name – Carradine. Um, David. James. David, yeah. Kate. No. All right, I must be getting senile. Um, but, yes, gorgeous guy. He was, in, he was in Dexter. Who was that guy? Which Carradine is that? Keith. Yeah, Keith. Beautiful man. So the men on that were very supportive to me, mm. ironically. And uh, the women were divas, actually. <laughs> but I th sometimes wonder when I look back on that experience if they were being method because the characters they were playing were very bitter and twisted, angry women. And um, unfortunately they kind of kept in those roles. <laughs> 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 and I was having to deal with the two of them. They weren't getting along. That's tough. Yes. Um, any other questions? One down the front here. Anyone else? Okay. Jocelyn, thank you for tonight. Um, interested in your views on the uh, rise of Netflix and other streaming uh, companies in terms of uh, producing films. And um, I'm, I'm a bit involved in the film society environment and uh, we're concerned about restricted access to movies. Have you got okay. anything to say about that? Oh, yep. Well, um, I have to admit I do watch Netflix. They've got some great shows. Um, I believe that they are not being currently very fair to um, Australian content and things like that. But um, I think that cable, that uh, video on demand is a reality that is here to stay and um, it's an opportunity for filmmakers to get their films seen, um, get unusual projects going, actually. It's quite the, – the film world now is very tough. Uh, that's why I've started working in television too, is trying to get a movie made that is not a tentpole blockbuster superhero movie um, is really hard. Uh, trying to do the kind of movies that I made even ten – you know, like Quilt – it would be hard to get that going now. Um, and who knows if I could make proof anymore. Uh, the dressmaker was very tough. And um, when we uh, were offered the chance to um, put it onto Amazon uh, in America, uh, we only agreed to do it as long as they could give us at least 
uh, a month in in a theater and they made a deal with broad green pictures and we got some some theater release it actually did so much better uh, as a downloadable film now i am a i'm an old school filmmaker i remember cutting films with trim bins and um seeing them on the big screen and I still love that and I wish everyone would see my films that way but the reality is they're not going to you know there's a lot of lot of people who just don't want to go to the cinema anymore and there's a lot of work for for interesting directors on cable and that I think you'll see that's what's happening more and more is that film directors Mm. uh because that's where the work is we still have to pay our rent we still have to pay our bills and we want our movies to be seen so we make that deal. It's like, okay, I guess um, in order to make, make our projects, we will go into, like, you know, everybody's doing it now. Um, we'll, go, we'll, we'll put our product on, on cable. It's really just to get an audience. Mm. Uh, but it's, I hope that the experience of seeing films in the theatre doesn't die out completely. I think that would be a terrible tragedy because it, it is a classic it's the purest form of cinema is to sit in a cinema and see it on a big screen in the dark with the beautiful sound uh, that you just don't get. It's not the same as watching it on television. And it'd be a shame if that completely died out. I think it's a nice note on which to end. Please thank Jocelyn Morehouse again, won't you? Thank you. (laughs) Well done. Thanks, everyone. If you head downstairs to the next level, uh, Jocelyn will be signing books down there for a short period of time. Thank you.